stuff. Recording is about to start and let's move to the share screen thing. And let's see if it's sharing screen. Yep, it does that. So that's good. And over to here. So, and I think uh, the attendance is open. Thank you very much, Bernardo. <laughs> Somebody spotted it. Brilliant. Well, you you deserve a medal for the services to all your students. Indeed, yeah. The Moodle man. Oh, I like that. <laughs> Bernardo, um, quotation marks, Moodle man, and then surname. <laughs> I really love that, that expression. Yeah, I think you truly deserve that. Okay. Um Oops, something fell down. Are you all right? Yeah, it's just that um, I've got a lecture right now. True, very true. true. I hope you are all right, Mohamed. Uh, no, um, it is to answer your question, don't worry too much about it. These are just uh, simply uh, some videos which I want you to watch uh, in your own time. But it's not going to be a big problem uh, for this lecture. OK, let's make a start uh, because, as you can tell, I'm hungry. You are probably hungry, some of you. So uh, I want my cold pizza. Anyway, um, last session, uh, that was on Wednesday, wasn't it? There is a link to these uh, videos. Uh, it's I put up a, a playlist link on Moodle. And uh, in the module on Moodle, on the right hand side, if you are on a desktop or laptop, or if you are on a tablet, right at the bottom, there's the Kent Player section where you find all the lecture recordings. Uh, but you can also go to my YouTube channel, PK11 Kent, on <laughs> YouTube, and there is a playlist with BI301 uh, for this academic year. So, uh, um, that there you find all the lecture recordings for this particular module. Okay, so uh, on Wednesday, uh, we had uh, an introduction to enzymes. We talked about uh, enzymes being incredibly efficient catalysts. Uh, what they do is basically they take a substrate, and I abbreviate that with an S, and they convert this substrate into a product. And the 
enzyme is then released and sort of recycled and can start a new uh, process again. So we really, really need only very small amounts of enzyme because it's constantly recycled uh, to do the job uh, quite efficiently. And we discussed that enzymes uh, usually are temperature, Um, that enzymes are usually sensitive to temperature. So uh, enzymes work uh, in a, a sort of a temperature optimum. They also work in a pH optimum. And by the way, can people hear me? Okay, good. So that's probably not our end here. And I think the suggestion of rejoining might be a good idea. Okay, so back to the enzymes. Um, so enzymes can uh, act very, very quickly um, and can deal with substrates very, very efficiently. And that's uh, really an important point to make. Enzymes also are specific are uh, usually, oh, let's write that in a different way. Enzymes have specificity. Enzymes display specificity. This means an enzyme can be specific for a substrate. or it can be specific and, or it can be specific for a reaction, or both. So, so substrate specificity means the enzyme will only work with one particular substrate, or compounds that are very similar to that substrate. So for example, a DNA degrading enzyme, and by the way, Anna, a DNA degrading enzyme will only use DNA. It will not uh, do anything with RNA or proteins. Or an enzyme that is specific for the substrate for a chemical compound like say pyruvate, will only work with pyruvate and that uh, will not touch any other substrates. Although some enzymes are a little bit more promiscuous, they're used in different uh, substrates, but we will come to that. So enzymes display substrate specificity and or uh, they display reaction specificity. So uh, an enzyme will do only one particular reaction type. So for example, a DNA uh, degrading enzyme will only degrade uh, DNA, uh, but it won't do any uh, additional modification. So usually one enzyme uh, catalyzes a particular reaction. Or for example, um, yeah catalyzes a particular reaction with a particular substrate. How do we name enzymes? Well, that's a little bit of a tricky thing because um, we um, usually you name an enzyme by, end, by adding uh, A's at the end of at the end of the substrate of substrate. So that's one way how you can name an enzyme. So for example, a thing A is, yes, a DNA is, DNAs would be an enzyme that is specific for DNA. 
And oh yes, uh, are there ends? Are there enzymes which can act, can use different substrates? Yes, absolutely. And we come to that um, uh, in a moment. So DNAs is an enzyme that works with DNA, but it doesn't tell you a lot what this enzyme does. Uh, occasionally, sometimes people refer to particular reactions uh, and they uh, an enzyme, for example, that catalyzes an oxidation and a reduction reaction would be an oxidoreductase. So here you've got the substrate, here you've got the reaction that the enzyme does, but it doesn't tell you uh, anything about the, about the substrate. Uh, quite often you combine this, so for example, the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase, carboxylase uh, will attach CO2, that's the carboxyl group, to the substrate pyruvate. So here you've got uh, basically both things, the substrate and the reaction, and that tells you something about what the enzyme does. The enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, lactate dehydrogenase, could you please mute yourself? Hydrogenase will remove hydrogens from uh, lactate and um, that's uh, basically a different uh, way of, uh, again, you've got the substrate and the reaction. Um, because there's quite an inconsistency with the naming, there is an international uh, sort of standard There's an international standard that has a sort of uh, a number nomenclature. That's the EC standard, the enzyme classification standard, where an enzyme uh, is, uh, will uh, receive some numbers. So one, two, three, three, or something like that. And for the experts who know how to read that, it is clear what this enzyme actually does. Uh, basically, nobody uh, knows these numbers without looking them up or if they are experts. So uh, please don't worry too much about that. Now, we said enzymes are specific and how do they do that? Well, I've put up a video or about specificity of enzymes. And the key point to remember is that enzymes usually have an active site. And again, I put up a video uh, about that. So they have an active site where all the action happens. And uh, usually very often this is denoted or is illustrated like that. So here's my little enzyme. And indeed, it looks like Pac-Man. Um, but uh, please don't think that enzymes look like that. So here is the active site. And there is where the enzymatic reaction actually happens. Um, the specificity is that there have been two uh, ways of explaining this specificity. And the old version was the lock and key model that was proposed. So the, um, the substrate would fit very nicely into this basically key, into this active site. And only if the substrate has the right shape, then it will fit into the active site and uh, nothing else uh, will fit there. And probably a lot of enzymes work similar to this uh, mechanism where there is a very, very clear 
defined structure and the substrate has to adopt this structure in order to fit. So that is the lock and key model. And that explains the substrate specificity of some enzymes. Um, however, uh, it could not explain that some enzymes can work with a number of different substrates. So example, for example, the enzyme uh, hexokinase. Ha, here's a question for you guys. What does the enzyme hexokinase use as a substrate and what does it do? Uh, six is good. Uh, it's used in as uh, uh -huh. So the substrate, what's the substrate for hexokinase? Hexo, what hexo? I can use glucose. It's a hexose, yes. It uses hexoses. So six ring sugars. And what on earth does a kinase do? And it actually, kinase is sort of the common name for adding AT, adding a phosphate group from ATP or transferring a phosphate group from ATP. So that's what hexokinase does. And a hexokinase uses can use a variety of sugars as long as they are six ring sugars. And how do we explain that? You can't really explain that with the lock and key model, but what you can uh, explain it with is that uh, the enzyme sort of modifies or adapts its shape, adapts the active site shape, the active site shape, so that similar molecules can actually bind to it. But if the molecules are too different, then they won't be able to, to bind. So basically, the, the, the substrate, in a way, uh, makes the enzyme uh, being able to bind the substrate. And this is the induced fit model induced fit model. And that means that the enzyme, the enzyme structure is not totally rigid and static. The enzyme shows a little bit of movement. It's a protein and therefore uh, the amino acids move around uh, depending on Brownian motion, on, on heat. Uh, so the, the uh, amino acids slightly move and the shape of the enzyme slightly changes uh, every millisecond or something like that. And uh, when the substrate with the right shape, with a right shape comes along, then the enzyme can accommodate that. And that is what is also called breathing of the enzyme. Does that make sense? Excellent, good. So these are the two different uh, models that we are looking at uh, most cases. So the lock uh, and key and the uh, induced fit model, although most enzyme will probably work with the induced fit model. Okay, so... Um, now, these are sort of the general concepts uh, for enzymes. 
And uh, what we now need to do is really we need to find a way how we can describe the action of an enzyme. How can we, for example, uh, compare enzymes with each other? And this was actually uh, quite a, a big problem. We knew about enzymes for, you know, thousands of years that uh, there are some compounds that do things. But how can we des describe these uh, things? How can we describe the action? And for that, we need to go back to BI308 a little bit when we did uh, kinetics. Yes, I know a lot of people hate that, but uh, hey, hey. So we said, for example, um, we can write a rate equation. So rate equation. And we can, if we have, for example, the reaction for an enzyme, it would be substrate. And so the substrate is consumed, so we can write for the rate change in substrate concentration per time equals, and uh, let's say we write, um, you know, a zero order reaction minus K times S, the concentration of S to the power of zero. So that would be a zero order reaction. You remember vaguely? And now with enzymes, when an enzyme reaction uh, happens, we can use that exactly the same way. We can look at what happens to the substrate because that is really the reaction that we formulated up here where the enzyme is converted into a product, where the substrate is converted into a product. Or we can also write it as ds over dt equals minus k times s to the power of 1. And that, of course, uh, was a first order reaction. Now, when we are working with enzyme, uh, the usually the way we are dealing with is uh, enzymologists don't like negative numbers. They don't like that they, you know, an enzymologist has it tough as it is. So they don't want to deal with a lot of negativity in their life. So what they usually do is they don't care about this negative sign. So they just simply take the absolute value, which I indicate here with these uh, vertical lines. So for an enzymologist, rate is always positive. Absolutely right. So for enzymes, we usually, enzymes uh, sort of by convention, convention, are uh, have positive rates. But it's just, you know, because we don't want to deal with negative numbers. So what we can do really is we can say, for example, if we've got a zero order reaction, we and we plot the substrate concentration here. So substrate concentration, and here we plot the rate. For a zero order reaction, this would look like something like that. Yeah, because even if we change the substrate concentration here, nothing happens because S to the power of zero is one. So the rate, so here the rate equals a constant. Here, the rate would be constant times the substrate concentration. So for a first order reaction, it would look like that. S rate 
and we would get probably something like that. Okay, so this is sort of what we need to bear in mind when we are dealing. This is exactly the same what we've done in the BI 308 in the kinetics part. Nothing has changed here. I just want this as a sort of a reminder because we will use it later on. Now, when people started to look at how can we describe enzymes, they started basically with what I've just written up there, but let me just write it again. We have an enzyme plus substrate, and this is converted into product plus enzyme. And as I said, the enzyme can start a new cycle once it has uh, finished. And um, so people thought, OK, good, uh, we can deal with that. But obviously, there is something in between. And if you think about it, if you think about it, we have an additional steps sort of uh, in there, or a number of steps in there. First of all, what happens, and I write this as a sort of an equilibrium like that, we have the enzyme and the substrate put together. Yeah, the P stands for product, indeed. So they form what is called an enzyme substrate complex. So this is the enzyme substrate complex. Substrate complex. That is when the substrate binds to the enzyme. We then have a conversion where the substrate is converted. This would be the enzyme product concept complex and some product and then the product is released from the enzyme and technically I should write this also as an equilibrium but there is a good reason why I'm writing it like that and very often what you will find is that people just simply don't mention this process because usually this is a very, very fast process and uh, we usually don't really observe it. The slowest process here, the reaction that is pretty slow, is this reaction here. So this is the slow reaction in the whole process. Okay, the only lower the uh, activation energy and then, as you rightly say, uh, go away and start a new cycle. So, now, the usual way how this is written is enzyme plus substrate, conversion, we have the uh, or binding and then we have this reaction enzyme plus product. And from our kinetics, we know that we can write this as a sort of with rate constants. You remember rate constants? So here we can write this as a rate constant, say K forward. This is K reverse. And this one here is K, let's call this K cut. That's the catalytic rate constant. So that is how we can write this uh, expression. And we just add these rate constants uh, to it. Now,
what is confusing? I'm confused. So KF is the forward rate constant. That is the reverse rate constant for the formation of this enzyme substrate complex. Reverse rate constant. And that is the catalytic rate constant. And with that, we can describe basically our reaction. And in theory, the whole process can be reversible because a reaction can go either way, can't it? Depending on the, the situation, a reaction can go either from left to right or right to the left. So even with an energy diagram, if you put some energy in, the reaction can go backwards. And an enzyme would be able to do both things. So uh, the enzyme could also, let's say, could work with the product and do it the other way around. It's, uh, if, if you have an equilibrium, then the enzyme can, can do both ways. Now, people were trying to figure out what is the rate of an enzyme? How can we describe the rate of an enzyme, enzyme reaction? How can we describe that? Well, one arrow is bigger than the other, or we look at uh, reactions that where the arrows are exactly the same. If if all the rate constants are exactly the same, then the rate then then the reaction can easily proceed uh, in either direction. So it doesn't, you know. Let's just stick with that. Uh, how that works here in this case. So the rate of an enzyme reaction, very often this is abbreviated with V, lowercase v for velocity. And there were two uh, scientists around 1900, uh, Maud Menton, she was a Canadian physiologist, and Leonard Michaelis, a German physical chemist, I think, who uh, both together came up with a description how we can actually mathematically formulate how fast the reaction proceeds. So we could write this as the rate, we could write this as dS over dt. And what they found was that this rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction depends on the substrate concentration, which is, you know, nothing new. We, we had something like that here. So here the rate depends on the substrate concentration. So that wasn't terribly exciting. But what was exciting was that they found it's not necessarily a first order reaction. What do you think the rate of an enzyme reaction, what order is the uh, reaction? Do you have any guess? It's a zero order reaction. Second order.
third order, first order. Okay, so I can reveal that the people who said it's a zero order reaction are absolutely right. It's a zero order reaction. Well done. And it's also, I can also reveal that the people who said it's a first order reaction, you are absolutely right. It's a first order reaction. So what now? Is it a zero or is it a first order reaction? How can it be both? Is the cat alive or is it dead? Do you know that, Schrödinger? <laughs> so what they found was you can describe this, um, this concept, the rate of an enzyme, with an equation, and this equation is written as enzyme concentration. And we're talking about the total enzyme concentration that we use. Enzyme concentration times K cut. That is our catalytic rate constant here. Times and here it comes. Here it comes. They found that you can describe this behavior of an enzyme by the equation substrate concentration divided by a constant, and this constant is usually abbreviated as Km plus the substrate concentration. Km is also called as the Michaelis constant. The Michaelis constant. Now this thing here, let me write this down again. V equals total enzyme concentration times K cut times substrate concentration divided by Km plus the substrate concentration. This is one of the most influential equations. This is a little bit like Einstein's E equals MC squared, but that is the equation, that is the equivalent of Einstein's equation for biochemists. And you absolutely must know this equation. There's no other way. Now, what does this equation actually tell us? Well, very often you see it in a slightly different format. You see it written as the rate of the reaction V equals, you see it written as V max. That's the maximum speed times substrate concentration over Km plus the substrate. So this means we have substituted this E total times the K cut by the expression V max. And V max is the maximum, maximum rate that the enzyme can do, rate of the enzyme. And as you can see, this Vmax
This Vmax depends on E total. So Vmax equals the total enzyme concentration times the rate constant K cut. So what happens to Vmax if I double the enzyme concentration? What do you think? If I double the enzyme concentration, what happens to Vmax? It also doubles. So if I do two times, two times the total enzyme concentration, then Vmax will be two times. Just simply following this relationship here, the higher the enzyme concentration, the higher Vmax. Okay, make sense? Now, what is this Km? What the hell is Km? Km actually is nothing else but a combination combination of the different rate constants of the different rate constants. So let me write this down again. E plus S, we have, sorry, we have the formation of the ES complex and we have E plus P. Here we said that's KF, that is KR, and that is K cat. And KM is defined as, and now I need to be careful, KR plus K cat divided by KF. So it is just a combination of these three rate constants here. So what would happen if you add a constant to another constant? Will that give you another constant or will that be a, a variable? You add two constants together and then divide by a constant. What do you get? It would be another constant. Absolutely right. It is a constant because a constant plus a constant. So if you have, for example, uh, let's say constant, let it be one and another constant, B2, if you add them together, you get one plus two, and that would be constant. It would not, uh, it would not change. So Km is a constant. Km is a constant. And that's very important. It's a constant party. Now don't constant party, please. Otherwise, you get, get told off. So, question for you guys. If Km is a constant, does it depend, does it depend on the substrate concentration? If Km is a constant. Absolutely right. It's, it does not depend on the substrate concentration. 
So Km is independent of the substrate concentration because it's a constant. Km, does it depend on the enzyme concentration? Absolutely right. It does not depend on the enzyme concentration. Well done. Now, I really, really need you to remember that. Km does not depend on the substrate concentration, nor does it depend on the enzyme concentration. Very, very important, and a lot of students get this wrong. And there will be questions about that. So Km is just simply a party of constants. So now, what have we got? We have the rate equals, let's write it like that, Vmax times the substrate concentration divided by the by Km plus the substrate concentration. That is our Michaelis Menten equation. And that is how you usually see it. Michaelis Menten equation. That is the important that is the important equation. But it turns out that the Michaelis Menten equation depends on a few assumptions. And it's very important that you know these assumptions. And the other equation here is just, it contains the total enzyme concentration times K-cat, which we substituted with this Vmax expression. So we can really write it as Vmax times S over Km plus S. The assumptions for the Michaelis-Menten uh, equation is firstly, the substrate concentration is much, much larger than the enzyme concentration. And in a way, it makes sense because we don't need a lot of enzyme. We only need, what's the technical term? Diddly squats of enzyme to do the trick, right? So, this michaelis menten equation can only be applied if the substrate concentration is much larger than the enzyme concentration. The second assumption is that we look right at the beginning of the reaction. look only at the beginning of the reaction. Why is that? Well, the problem is when we look at the rate of the reaction, when we look at the rate of this reaction, the rate depends on the substrate concentration. So if we wait a little bit, the rate will slow down because we lose substrate. That's what the enzyme is using. So the rate will change dramatically over time, and which makes it a total nightmare. So this reaction, this Michaelis-Menten equation, 
looks at a, right at the beginning of the reaction where we actually know how much substrate we have. So this is also called, when we look at the beginning of the reaction, we measure the starting rates, starting rate, or another word for that is the initial rate of the reaction. So we can do the michaelis menten equation only with the, when we look at the initial rates. That's very important. And there is a third reaction and everything becomes clear, I hope. The, this michaelis menten equation is only applicable only applicable if the reaction is irreversible, is irreversible. That means the reaction can only go enzyme plus substrate. This can be a reversible reaction here, the formation of the enzyme complex but it can only go into the enzyme plus product. It cannot go into this reaction. It can only work, this equation, if we are looking at a one-way reaction this way. If there is a reverse reaction, it will not work. We cannot use this michaelis menten equation. So therefore, this is also called the irreversible, irreversible michaelis menten equation. There is also a mathematical expression for a reversible reaction, but I think we are probably not dealing with that right at this part uh, of the course. So we have the irreversible michaelis menten equation, which is this format here. We make the assumption that the substrate concentration is much larger than the total enzyme concentration. We need to look only at the beginning of the reaction, so we measure initial rates, and it is only applicable if the reaction does not go backwards. So that's the irreversible michaelis menten equation. We said that Km does not depend on the substrate concentration or the enzyme concentration, because Km is just simply a constant. And we said that V max, on the other hand, depends on the enzyme concentration and also on one of the rate constants. So this is the really important message for this lecture. And uh, next week, next Wednesday, we will continue with this michaelis menten equation. And I think there is a YouTube video in the playlist. And I want you to have a look at that. Uh, about the michaelis menten equation and uh, so that we can sort of go a little bit deeper what this equation actually tells us and what information we get from it. Does that make sense to you? In this case, thank you very much for watching. I wish you all a very good uh, weekend. Uh, please don't, if you do the BI308 module, please don't forget to complete the pH stuff. That would be really great if you could do that.
and uh, have a look at the playlist. All I want you to do or on that playlist is have a look at the Michaelis Menten uh, video. Uh, I think that is uh, video uh, number seven. Uh, it's, it's called Michaelis Menten Equation. Thank you very much. See you next week. And I'm looking forward to my pizza now. Take care. Bye bye.